So, it is January 2020. I'm sitting at my desk, it's a Friday afternoon, and every Friday afternoon I spend time to reflect on the last week, last performance of our portfolio, my performance as an investor, board member, coach, you name it. And it's the first week in January, it's quiet. So I spend time trying to understand investment biases. You know, we investors are our worst enemies. There is a bias called confirmation bias, and that is so true. If we love a founder, if we love a technology, a product, our due diligence usually confirms it's great. And then there's resulting bias. That is, you equate the quality of the result with the quality of your decision. So if a startup succeeds, you say it was a great decision to invest, and if it fails, it was a bad decision. And that's bullshit, I'm sorry. Yeah? What you can influence is the decision-making process. If you do that thoroughly, the rest has also to do with luck. So I'm sitting there and said, how can I actually re reduce the portion of luck when I invest? Because I want to make good investments, and if you're a founder, I want to bring you there. To your house at the Côte d'Azur, party with a DJ, have free drinks with friends, and the next day you look like this. Great exit. Why is it so good for me? Because our interests are aligned. I get a big check if you succeed, and you get a big check if you succeed. That's great. So how can I get you there? And I dive deeper into statistics. You know probably this statistic, and it relates a little bit to the nine no's we have heard previously. Only one company out of 10 succeeds. Now, I think that's not bad news. If you look around, I would believe that everybody thinks he's the one, she's the one. Yeah. But what is success? If I were a founder, I created a business of 5 million in revenues with a 40% margin, so I bring home 2 million each year. In five years, I've, have, I've got my house at the Côte d'Azur, so it's success. But that's not the success that venture capital investors are looking for, and that's probably not what you have in mind. You want to grow a business beyond the 10 million, probably towards 100 million, and then you p become interesting for me as a growth capital investor. Now there's another st statistic, and that says it's already difficult to get to some kind of success, but only 0.6% get over the 10 million threshold. So it's difficult to build a business, but it's even more difficult to grow it. And I wanted to understand why. Why is it that only one out of 167 gets there? And if you want to get to 100 million, the statistics looks even worse. I looked into my portfolio, tried to see, can I actually see patterns? And I saw one pattern, which is not a great epiphany. I saw the startups who failed, they burned a lot of cash. They ran out of cash. But the interesting part was, also the ones that succeeded had, it, had high cash burn. So I concluded it must have been one layer deeper. And I looked into it, and I found out what I call good and, and bad cash burn. The companies that succeeded had good cash burn. They burned cash in order to capture market share on the basis of a working business model. And the ones who failed actually wanted to grow, 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 grow from the very beginning, and they wanted to build the plane while flying. And then I came across an interesting study conducted by Genome Report, Berkeley University, and Stanford University. They analyzed 3,200 startups in order to figure out why do some succeed and why fa some others fail. And they came to a similar conclusion. Those who fail, fail due to premature scaling. And premature scaling comes in many shapes and forms. You invest too heavily in growth before you have found product market fit. You hire too many employees early on, many shapes and forms. But the point is, you have not yet validated the business model. And then the crisis hit, the pandemic came, it was March, and I decided, why not share what I found in a book? And I thought, you know, I, I don't have to commute anymore, so I have time, which was also not a real realistic assumption. 
So it, it took certainly a lot longer, but I've written this book, Fast Scaling, and that is also why I'm here today to talk about fast scaling. And fast scaling has translated my findings into an advice how you can actually grow your business in a smart manner. This is not the only growth strategy. Blitz scaling is a good strategy as well, but only in markets where the market actually requires you to prioritize speed over efficiency. Otherwise, you are better off fast scaling. Take it a bit slower, like crawl, walk, run. Maybe you fly later on. First build a solid high growth foundation, and then you accelerate growth. The study also found out that the ones who take it a little bit slower in the beginning actually grow 20 times faster later on. And this is actually not a surprise if you think about it. If you have validated the business model first, you sell something that your customers want. They stay, they come back and buy, they tell others about your great product. It reduces customer acquisition costs. It increases customer lifetime value. And the best part is, usually, it reduces the payback period. The money that you can invest into acquiring customer comes back fast, and you can reinvest it. And this is kind of a spinning wheel. And this is why the ones who take it a little bit slower end up growing faster. So fast scaling has nine building blocks. But here, it's about early stage startups. So I'm concentrating on the first part, which is building a solid high growth foundation. If you get there, it's time to accelerate growth. So no surprise, if you don't target a large market, you cannot build a big business. But, and that is unfortunate, and today I met a founder who told me the market was 700 million, billion, trillion, I don't know. It was like this. That's the second slide in, in a pitch deck. A huge bubble with a huge number. Don't do that. Don't do that to me, at least. Yeah, if you come to me, you have kind of an idea of how many customers are out there. You should know how many customers, what can you charge them, how big is your total addressable market, how much can you service, yeah, and how much of that market can you obtain. Be granular, be thorough if you talk to me about the market size. And that's also advice. If I were a founder, I would spend a significant amount of time really analyzing, is the market really big? Because most markets are not big as founders think. And don't do this. Yeah. The market, the 700 trillion market, is actually even bigger because we will also get into adjacent markets. That might be true, but it's only an option. Be precise here. Product market fit. Probably also not a surprise, but if you sell something that your customers do not want, they will not come back, they will speak badly about you, and that's not good for your business. You need to validate your business model, you need to talk to your customers, you need to improve your product, but you know, wait until you are there before you accelerate growth. What I do as an investor, I look into customer cohorts. Each month, you should actually see better cohorts. Customers stick around, are more engaged, um, it's, a, it's a longer lifetime, so you kind of indicate you're getting to product market fit. There is not this one number where you get to product market fit. It's also a feeling, but wait until you get there. And then Mark Andresen said product market fit is all that matters. It, it, it's not true. One example, you sell something to small independent restaurateurs. The Luigi, my favorite pizzeria, you, s you want to sell something to him, a digital product. Pre-pandemic, at least, you call them and say, I have a digital product for you. You would like hang up or maybe say I'm not interested and hang, uh, would hang up. So the point is, he has a very low willingness to pay, but you have to go out there to speak to him. This is high customer acquisition cost. You don't have the right channel for your product. So that's why you need to work on product market fit and product channel fit in parallel. You need to find a channel to your customers that works for your product. That translates in strong unit econo economics. As I said before, product market fit, product channel fit, then it works. And actually, one could think, now let's go out and accelerate growth. And that's what I did with the team in the board of one company we have invested in. Everything just looked great. And then this was me. The tech couldn't cope with the growth. 
We lost one year to totally re-engineer the infrastructure. We've heard um, from the Amazon guy, you know, the, the shift from, micro, uh, from tr uh, monolithic structure to microservices. Yeah? This company told me from the very beginning, like 99% of all founders tell me, they are transitioning to microservices. Yeah? Um, I don't believe this anymore was a major learning. Um, make sure your tech is scalable. These are the five building blocks, large market, product market fit, product channel fit, translates into strong unit economics, and then make sure that your tech is strong. So I've written this book. It has become a number one bestseller. This is great. And then I sat at my desk again. I said, OK, now I know 70% failed due to premature scaling. What about the rest? So I looked into this. And I found this. CB Insights analyzed post-mortems. So founder wrote why they believe they failed. And to be very honest, I found this kind of funny that people really think they fail because they run out of cash. That's crap. You don't run out of uh, fail because you run out of cash. You run out of cash because you fail. So, but there was no evidence. So I talked to founders. And this usually went that way. I asked, why have you failed? And there were several answers. Some also said they ran out of cash. But I applied this technique invented by Toyota. I asked five times why. And whenever I came, at least at the latest, to the fifth why, it was amazing what we f figured out. Everything had to do with leadership. Every, every failure had to do with one decision a founder has made. So they run, do not run out of cash. It's the other way around. What founders do, and that this is hopefully something that you can take with you today, and I've seen that leadership is a great topic in, in this conference, do not incur le leadership debt. You usually incur this in the early stage phases, so the stage you are in. This is the point where you make major decisions. Um, which market uh, you, do you want to target? Which product do you build? Um, these are major decisions. And in the early stage, you can pivot. You have a team of maybe 10 people. You are involved in the major decisions. But in the scaling phase, the company has maybe 50 employees, 100 employees. You can rarely pay back the leadership debt that you have incurred. It's almost impossible, like the growth strategy. If you have found an investor and you poured into uh, millions into, into growth, you hired people, and then you say, oh, we need to pull back, it's rarely, rarely possible. So really, I recommend take leadership seriously. At one point in time, you're not in charge of the business, you're not in charge of the customer, you're in charge of the people who are in charge of the business and in charge of the customer, as Simon Sinek once said, and that is so true. And if you are not prepared, then you will fail. You will create a business that gets to 5 million to 6 million, but you cannot build a high growth organization, you cannot lead that organization, and you won't get uh, beyond the 10 million. I don't have statistical evidence, but I believe this is the major reason why some companies make it to the, or become the one out of 10, but so many fail to get really big. There's debt that you cannot repay. Maybe you know a pick note or from private equity. You cannot repay it. You incur, uh, you have the debt, and you incur interest on it. And only at the end you will repay it, because you cannot repay it earlier. And this is really serious debt, and there are two examples. You choose the wrong co-founder. You cannot exchange your co-founder. Really, really difficult. And then here are investors in the room. If you choose the wrong investor, you are stuck. Mark Suster once said, there is no divorce clause in investment agreements. If you accept an investor, he's on your board, you have to work with him or her for years. Don't choose your investor only based on valuation. You want someone who creates value for your business that you can personally click with, that helps you on your journey. So what can you do? to be the one out of 167. Well, first, as I said, choose the right growth strategy. 
It's not always fast scaling, but unless you are required to speed up and prioritize speed over efficiency, take it a bit slower, and the prob probability you succeed is higher. Invest in your leadership skills. Hire a coach, read books. I always hear, I don't have time to read books. Read books. Read books about leadership. The problem with leadership books is, at least that's the feedback I get, and I, I think I can confirm this, is it's fragmented advice that you get. It's, it comes in piecemeal fashion. You hear you need to trust and inspire. You hear that you have to hire people who tell you what to do. It's difficult. But you have to transition from founder to leader. You would watch for leadership debt, mistrust in the team, finger pointing, blaming. If people don't work, we also heard about teamwork, how important this is. Um, if, you, if you sense that something is wrong, think about yourself. You are the starting point. There's no one to blame but you, because if someone makes a mistake, somehow you have hired that person. It's always the founder's fault. Take ownership of processes and results. And my wife was not happy, but I sat down and told her I would do it again. I wrote actually two books. This is Leading Effectively. It's comparable with Fast Scaling. It's written as a guide. It will be published in, on this, in December. And I've given it a try. I wrote a novel, a leadership novel. It's called The Leadership House, which will be published in November. And then my creative phase is over. But I hope all three books help you guys. Thanks a lot. Patrick, thank you very much. Preach, brother, preach. Yeah. Leadership <laughs> solves every problem you have. So yes. true, so true. Every problem is leadership. Talk about, okay, just real fast, leadership debt, meaning by that, did I understand correctly, you mean the little or big decisions that we make early on have consequences all the way through. Is that kind of what you meant by that? I think it's every poor leadership decision creates this kind of leadership debt, and you can repay it, the bad decisions, if you, if you change them, but not investing in leadership skills. This is the most severe leadership debt you can incur, because that is hard to be, re to be repaid. If you don't start now, at some point, if you have 50, 100 employees and you say, now I have to transition to leader, yeah, yeah, yeah. that's too late. That, that leadership debt you cannot repay. Sure. You can only manage five, eight, maybe 10 people in front of you. Uh. Beyond that, you're working at an indirect level of leadership. Exactly. You've got to practice that. And you want, you, know, you want the others to make the decision. You don't, don't want to become the decision bottleneck where everybody asks you, should I do this now? No, you want people who are themselves leader, who take decisions yeah, and build a, a team that functions as well, so you, that leadership trickles down the whole organization. That's the goal, and then you can really sit back and, and focus on helping the people grow. I love it. Patrick, thank you very much for your time. Yes. One more round of applause for Patrick. Thanks. Thank you, sir. Thanks.